Do you love going to Broadway shows, but can't go now because Broadway's closed? Join tour guide Tim and Velasco too as they bring Broadway history to you. Grab your Broadway passport for what's in store on your virtual Broadway tour. Anyone in attendance at the opening night of the Plymouth Theater, now the Schoenfeld, on October 10th, 1917, might have experienced a moment of deja vu when first entering the auditorium. For only 13 days prior, a theater with the exact same design had opened one block away, the Broadhurst. If you tuned in last week, you know that as part of architect Herbert J. Kraft's efficient plan to quickly build two theaters for the Schubert brothers, he designed the Plymouth and the Broadhurst to be twins. With one facade facing 44th Street and the other fronting on 45th, Kraft felt no one would ever notice that the theaters were mere images of each other. To further disguise the identical architectural designs, he outlined the facade of the Plymouth in terracotta trim. So, as we kick off this week, my question for you is, as you waited in line to see a show at either of these two theaters and were posing for your last minute theater selfie, did you ever notice they're identical? During the construction of the Plymouth, the Schuberts took notice of the artistic successes of producer Arthur Hopkins and enlisted him to manage the theater. Hopkins was quite different from the other noted producers of the early 1900s. While others were first and foremost interested in making a profit, Hopkins set out to make art of the highest caliber. Leading with his theatrical aesthetic, the Plymouth was filled with actors of the highest caliber. John Barrymore, Gertrude Lawrence, and Tallulah Bankhead, among many others. Hopkins had been searching in vain for years for his own venue to showcase his artistic productions. So when the Schubert brothers offered him the Plymouth, it was a match made in heaven. He set up a small office in the building with a window overlooking the entrance to the theater below, which he maintained even when he was no longer working on shows at the theater until he died in 1950. In the years leading up to his death, Hopkins became known as the Sphinx of 45th Street because he did very little talking and was always straight to the point. One can almost still imagine Hopkins looking down from his office window onto all of the fine, dramatic productions now in residence on 45th Street, productions that he helped usher in with his many efforts many years prior. Reminiscent of the rivalry between the original Schubert Brothers and the Theatrical Syndicate, Gerald Schoenfeld and Bernard Jacobs of the Schubert Organization were in constant competition with the Niederlander Organization. Every new show on Broadway's horizon was an opportunity for either of the opposing organizations to jump ahead of the other. In 1980, the Royal Shakespeare Company was looking to transfer their hit eight and a half hour production of The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby to Broadway. Starring a young, brilliant Roger Reese, the show had opened in London's West End to rave reviews. With the need for an at the time mammoth $4.4 million to move the show across the Atlantic Ocean, the Royal Shakespeare Company would have to be creative in order to get it produced. The Niederlander organization had the rights to the show, the Schuberts had the perfect theater, the Plymouth, and neither wanted to budge. Independent producers Elizabeth McCann and Nell Nugent were on friendly terms with both parties and convinced all involved that they could work together by voting on every decision. Majority rules, no squabbling. In the end, it worked. Nicholas Nickleby, the first joint venture between Schubert and Niederlander, went on to win the Tony for Best Play in 1982, and one of the most bitter rivalries on Broadway in the latter half of the 1900s was, well, less bitter. In 2005, the Plymouth would finally be renamed, but not as the Arthur Hopkins Theater that many had previously proposed. To honor the achievements of the two lawyers who, beginning in 1963, had saved the Schubert organization from financial ruin after the death of J.J. Schubert, the Plymouth and neighboring Royale were renamed the Gerald Schoenfeld and Bernard B. Jacobs, respectively. The commemoration was the brainchild of Pat Schoenfeld, wife of Gerald, who solicited approval of the board of the Schubert organization to make her dream a reality. 
Her only request was that both new marquees should be vertical to match the neighboring booth and Golden Theaters, creating a stunning visual image when looking down the block from 8th Avenue. When the marquees were officially unveiled on May 9th, 2005, Give My Regards to Broadway was sung by hundreds who had gathered for the special moment as Gerald Schoenfeld and the family of the late Bernard B. Jacobs finally saw their names and lights, capping decades of triumphs to make Broadway the best it can be. And every time I walk down 45th, I silently thank Pat for her vertical insistence. To me, it feels iconically Broadway. Hello! Happy Saturday noon on Broadway uh, here at Broadway Up Close. Thank you for joining us as part of our virtual Broadway tour series. Um, each week we're coming to you live with someone who has worked at the theater we're featuring that week. And this week we are joined by the incredible Heather Parcells from the Chorus Line Revival at the Schoenfeld. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with me or Broadway Up Close, my name is Tim Dolan. Uh, I'm an actor and the owner of Broadway Up Close Walking Tours in New York City. For the last 10 years, since 2010, we've been hitting the sidewalks, unearthing history, uh, ghost stories, fun facts, all the things you didn't know you didn't know that you really want to know about the 41 Broadway theaters. I have an entire team that I call my green team that are all actors and stage managers um, that are your eyes and window to the world of all of our weird, theatrical, insane lives. Uh, we have five exterior tours. Last fall, we opened our first interior tour. So we take you inside the oldest Broadway theater, which is the Hudson on 44th Street. For all of the information about all those tours, you can always head to our website, www.broadwayupclose.com. You shouldn't do that now. You should wait till we're done talking to Heather and then you should go to look at things about my life. Uh, we opened a gift shop a year ago in the middle of Times Square. I just thought like, it'll be so easy. I'll open a brick and mortar gift shop. That'll be fun. Ugh, here we are. Um, it's going well, but it's, uh, it's brick and mortar. It's had its moments. Uh, with our gift shop, uh, it's right in front of the Lion King uh, and the new McDonald's in the middle of Times Square. Uh, it is 60 square feet of Broadway love and joy and gifts. And next to it, we have a six foot tall Broadway sign that is 150 light bulbs that you can take your perfect Instagram moment with. Um, all of that is closed because of the shutdown and pandemic and COVID-19 and welcome to our lives. Um, but eventually it'll all be open. Uh, In-person tours are back on. But again, look at that schedule later. Let's hang out with Heather first. Um, when this all happened, March 12th, uh, 2020, was the day of the shutdown in the tour guide community. We call it Red Thursday, where everything kind of flatlined. Um, you know, the initial idea was, oh, we'll just close down for a couple of weeks. And then it was a month and then it was two months and now it's six months. Uh, and we are officially six months in. I think it's going to be at least another six months. Uh, who knows? Um, and so I thought, well, I was missing connecting with people, uh, missing seeing all of you, missing seeing shows, talking to people, doing shows. And so I thought we'll bring our itineraries online and we'll do a little fun fact every day, one theater every week, 41 theaters 41 weeks uh, will be done in March of 2021. Hopefully the end, of, uh, the end of this series will hopefully be the reopening of Broadway. Who, again, who knows? Um, for those who have joined us the entire journey so far, I love you. For those who are new, I also love you. I love you a little less, but um, welcome. Uh, we're starting with the oldest, the Hudson, which was week one, and we're moving forward in time chronologically when the theaters were built, which brings us today to week 14, the show in Feld. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed all the history, the fun facts this week uh, with this identical twin theater to the Broadhurst. Uh, and how's today gonna work? For today's series, we will learn all about Heather's theatrical journey, her time working at the Schoenfeld in the Chorus Line Revival. Uh, if you have any questions for her or me along the way, drop it in the comments. If you haven't done it already, drop in the comments and let's say hi and let me know where you're watching from. Hi. Uh, and I think that's everything I have for you. Um, and so, Without further ado, join me in welcoming Broadway's Heather Parcells. Hi! Hello! Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. How are you? I'm great. I didn't realize that it was the 14th, 14th built. That's amazing. And uh, yeah. in fact, I've also worked in the Broadhurst. So I- uh, Yes. As I was looking at your life, I was like, oh wait, you've oh, yeah. done in both these theaters. Yep. They must have been a weird deja vu moment. You're like, wait, haven't I worked in this building already? This is all the same. Did you realize they're the same? Um, well, no, I didn't know they were the same. I have no, if you I have stories about backstage between the two of them. We have some well, I can't wait. So that's what, yeah. 
So yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Um, so hi, welcome. Um, before we get to all of that, let's talk about for those who don't know you or aren't lucky enough to know you. Um, tell us where you're from, uh, where you grew up, maybe when you first got like bit by the theater bug, early theater life, and then get us essentially all the way up till when you got to New York City and you if you weren't born here and we start auditioning, and then we'll talk Broadway debut and 37,000 Broadway shows, and we'll go from there. I wish it was 37,000. <laughs> well, okay, okay 36,000, a little less. I am going to do it really fast because- Yeah, give me like a yeah quick bio <laughs> version. Both, sometimes. So the short version, I was born in Syracuse, New York, lived there for like six weeks. Um, I grew up in Newport News, Virginia. I am currently in Virginia, not in Newport News. I'm at a lake, a beautiful Smith Mountain Lake. I've been here for four months. Um, I moved, nice. uh, so I went to, I grew up in Newport News. I horseback rode. I did not do theater. Um, I started dancing when I was 18 and I said, Hey, what? I know I'm weird. I know I'm weird. I'm weird, I'm weird, I'm weird. Um, I mean, I, I did too, but it's normal for guys. I know. It's, a, it's a, I'm a weirdo. And, and because of that, I love to sing. Like I would sing jingles. I loved commercial jingles. Um, it was my dream to do a commercial jingle. I actually fulfilled that dream. Another story. But, um, <laughs> The coolest thing that was that I, when I was horseback riding, I would sing as I was riding and my parents were like, well, what do you want to do when you go to college? Both my parents are in the medical profession. And I was like, I like to sing and whatever. So my dad was like, okay, listen, I don't know anything about theater, but I do know how to research. So we researched, we went to the library because there was no internet, right. went yeah. to the library, looked up like top 10 musical theater schools, what you need to do to get in. Um, and I ended up going to Florida State University. Um, wow. Uh, and I got my BFA in musical theater. And then I moved to New York right after college. I mean, I went to a summer theater in North Carolina. Then I moved to New York it, uh, right after college. I learned to dance in college and during my summer shows and I like, worked at theme parks. I loved them. And then so I got to New York in 2000. And I was one of those things, you know, it's like if you ever want a show or if you ever want to get a job, either book a vacation, buy, get an apartment, like any of the big things. I yeah. found an apartment and I literally 10 days later, booked the national tour of Chicago and played Velma. So that's how I started. Come on. <laughs> oh my God. You know, I had one of those really weird experiences of, of you know, I hit success really early on and, and kept going. And it's been as I've gotten older that I'm like, oh. Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And oh. a Broadway shutdown doesn't help anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> crazy. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, let's de uh, deconstruct that. So you go to college and you're like, you're majoring in musical theater, mining, minoring in horseback riding, and well, you've never really danced. And yeah. then like 10 days after you get to New York, you're yeah, in one of the biggest Fosse. dance, you're doing Fosse in the biggest dance musical. So like where you just are a quick study, you yeah. always had good control of your body and it just like came easy. Like talk me through all of that. Yeah, I mean, I apparently, because, you know, looking back, when I when I had to audition for college, some of the requirements at the time were you had to put together your own dance. So my okay. dad, um, I I grew up near Tiffany Haas. Tiffany Haas was in Wicked. She was a, sure, sure. Um, and, and on Broadway and whatnot. But her mom owned a dance studio. So my dad called her because we went to we went to high school together or something like that. And my dad called her mom and was like, hey, my daughter is doing blah, blah, blah. We need to get a dance choreographed. What do we do? And she recommended a, you know, like a choreographer. We're in a small town, mind you. This isn't like fancy. And this is also sure. 95, 96. <laughs> um, uh, and I, he called her and she came over and she was like, okay, I'm going to set stuff on you. You're like, as you do, you're like, hi, my daughter has no dance experience. Can you set a dance <laughs> on her? You know, and so he came, he came over. We went to my gym, like my dad's gym. Apparently, I have a lot of natural talent. My feet okay. are like bananas. I have like an arch for Crazy. days. I could show you, but that would be awkward. Um, <laughs> so, horseback riding, you're all you're flexed all the time. It's like this, right? And of course, you had to reverse it. And sure. he just started giving me stuff, and I could do it. Like I literally, I have a video of this. I did wet day turns in my dance. <laughs> I just. I <laughs> like never having, like, who are you? I know. And by the way, I've not done them since, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's what happened is like, she just showed me and I just started doing, and it was one of those things. I had a lot of natural rhythm. I clearly yep. had some kind of facility. Uh, I was 
relatively flexible. Not, I'm not super bendy at all, but I was relatively flexible and I had a lot of sass. Like, even though I'm Polish and Hungarian, I had like a little, I have like a little bit of Cuban and like Hispanic in me somewhere. Sure. Um, so that's where that came from. And so when I got to school, I recognized, I have the ability to like recognize what you need to do. And I was like, I need to focus on this dance thing because, boy, you know, you have to put time. There is no way to just be talented. Right. You right. have to, even if you are talented, you have to put stuff in. So I right. just, I just focused. That's what I did. I focused on it and focused on it. And cause I knew it was my weakest, if you will, yeah. which yeah. is crazy because now I get hired for it. Right. Um, so that's what crazy. I did. Crazy. Okay. So then you booked Chicago <laughs> and you booked Velma. Yeah. So it was the non-equity, let's be honest here, but we were the first. Please so come on. It's 10 days after <laughs> you've only been there 10 days. It was, like... exploded. it was, yeah, it was crazy. It, it was one of those things where shortly, like basically it was the first Broadway show. Cause we had the Broadway sets, the Broadway costumes. I wore yeah. like, I had everything. We even had a union band and a union crew. We were the first non-union to go out as the Broadway. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Before, and it was that Chicago tour was like some years it would go at non-equity, but then the next year, everyone was equity was a, it was always the weird one. It was the weird one. We were the first one, uh, that year in 2000 was the first one to go out and pretend it was the Broadway. Right. right. Um, and then, yes. And then they really, they did go back. Cause after we were done, then it went equity again. Yeah. Um, or excuse me, union again. So that's what I did. And it was a year. It was bus and truck. I mean, but I got to go to Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. I went to every state, I think, except for the one without Mount Rushmore. So North Dakota. I didn't go to sure. North Dakota. <laughs> um, Crazy. And so you and and what I'm gathering from you is there wasn't at this point in time and, you know, it's been a minute, but there wasn't a lot of fear. It's just kind of like, I'm going to do this and I'll just do it. And maybe that comes from being riding a horse. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I've never ridden a horse, but I would imagine, I don't know. There, I would think there'd be a lot of fear involved with that. Uh, but maybe that's where it comes from. But to lead, I love that. You, that you, know. you know what I mean? It's like, you're just like, I don't know where do you, where do I stand? I don't know. It's just crazy to me that you were like, and then I did that. You know what I think, Tim, you and I, cause we've been doing this for a long time now. I yeah. myself would have said the same thing if somebody else had said that to me. I agree with you. I didn't have fear cause I had no knowledge. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't have the internet. I didn't over research. I hadn't been dancing. I hadn't been in the theater really. I went to a prep school. Anybody in the world who wanted to be in the show could, you know, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't understand that there were boundaries at all. Um, I wish that I felt that way now. I yeah, wish that's the thing. I, you know. That naivete really can work in your favor. Um, yeah. You know, certainly there is, uh, you, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses, but that, that initial thoroughly modern Millie set down the suitcases, like mm -hmm. I'll just go for it. That I, I do. I wish as I'm an older human now at 35, I'm like, I wish I had like a, I could tap into that just a little easier. Well, um, okay, so it's pure. It's being yeah. pure. All I cared yeah. about was performing. Like there was nothing. Yeah. I didn't have social media. I didn't have people. Nobody was telling me no. Everybody was like, wow, you're doing that? That's crazy. And I was just like, yeah, I love to sing. This is amazing. I never got to do this. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, so you finish that tour. It goes well. You don't go to North Dakota, but that's okay. And then what happens from there? Um, then I got my equity card on a tour of some like it hot with Tony Curtis. Oh my God. I saw you in that. Where? Uh, I left after six months. Oh, I okay. Like, so ah. maybe not. I saw it in Detroit, Michigan. No, I wasn't. At the there. Fox. Okay. So no, maybe. I wasn't. No? I was. Were you? I was. I was. Oh my. Up. Really? Oh my God. Tony Curtis. My mom was like, don't you know who this is? I was like, I don't know who that is. I, all the tap dancing, the tap dancing gangsters. Yeah. It was so good. It was honestly, okay. So for what it's worth, Tony Curtis is a gem and he would literally, we, we would be in rehearsal and he would just stop for a second. And he, they, like the director would say, so Tony, when you were doing the movie, what was it like? And all of a sudden silence because the entire room was like, Phew. and he would just go, well, Marilyn would come this way. I'm like, that's my version of Tony Curtis. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, blah, 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 blah. And he would just regale us with the coolest and also some of like a little bit illicit stuff, which was kind of amazing. And I won't talk about it here. Sure. But he was just the coolest. Like he would just talk about it. He was generous. He was giving. He was um, sort of blind, had a short term memory lock. He had teleprompters and he had no hearing in his right ear. Great. So Perfect. Sign him up. Would, like lead him around the stage. I mean, it was a sweet little show. Wow. Uh, it was 
It, the dancing, I loved tap dancing. That was so much fun. Who choreographed that? Do you remember? His name is Dan Serretta. He also, ah. he's in the original 42nd Street. Okay. He's brilliant. He's one of those choreographers who's actually brilliant, but then second guesses himself. So like the first time he like lays it out, we're like, oh my God. And then he's like, well, what if we do? We're like, no. No, no, no. Keep it, keep it. Yeah. Crazy. Okay. So some like it hot. I, I had never made that connection. I was, okay. here we are. You're great. Very talented. Um, and so then what's your Broadway debut? Oh, so yes. So then I, you said Thoroughly Modern Millie. I went on the tour with Millie. That was fun. I love that show. And then I, um, then I actually auditioned for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and I got my Broadway debut in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang under that car, which was wow, a car it was cool. And all the dogs and all of the eight dogs, eight not dogs. under study. We had fifteen children and a fifty-person cast. Come on, it was crazy. and it and four minutes later they were like we're closing. So okay, so <laughs> what's long one? We were open for almost a year. No, I was gonna say no. You did well financially. <laughs> it did not go well. Um, so. Okay, you book that, and it's in the huge mammoth. At that point in time, was still called the uh, the Hilton. I was going to say, I think it changed the Hilton. And is it? Uh, I'm always fascinated when people step on a Broadway stage and they get in front of an audience. What's the first moment? Do you remember it? Was it magical? Um, it, do you tell me what your memory is of that first moment? Okay, the funny thing is, I don't remember the first moment, but what okay. I remember is opening night. Uh -huh. when the um the car flew the way that they did it it had like one of those like arms that would move forward like a tilt-a-whirl kind of thing sure so the car would move move through and also to be able to do the projecting the image because it went in front on the you know in the audience they had all the light on the car we were in complete dark and they would put the lights on the um audience so that like that illusion of oh it's in, you know, whatever. But we had yeah. all of us in the final scene when we're waving at Chitty Bye, Chitty Bye. They, you could see the entire audience. And my mom and dad were sitting in the second row of the mezzanine for opening night. <laughs> Could I have oh, right now? So yeah, I, saw oh, my mom and, I saw my mom and dad and just smiling. And I was like, I made it. I did it, mom. Oh my God. Oh, what do you pay for my braces? And <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you're gonna make me cry this is not how i saw this saturday going we're already all emotional from ruth bader ginsburg like come on what are we doing i mean she's the reason i can do half the stuff i do yeah so, truly I mean, heather that is crazy and beautiful and that's beautiful yeah. i love that i love that you those three words i made it I mean, um, well, but that's not the, but now i said that when i was 25 i don't right. i don't necessarily believe that you don't make it if you're not on broadway Correct. Oh, yeah, I, that that. Dev, correct. We could do an entire podcast of just those three words. And that's what's mo most fascinating to me is like these, the reconciliation of when you thought, oh, if I've done that, I'll have made it. And it's like these moments where you're like, oh, now I've made it. And then 10 years go by and you're like, oh, no, no, no. Now I've, and then the other people's versions and your parents' versions of making yeah. it, to me, those three words are so, there's lots to unpack. I think it was more along the lines of, all your money was up was <laughs> like that kind of all that blind. Oh God, my daughter's going to theater. Like that's what made it. I yeah. mean, that happened. So they're like, yeah. oh, thank God. Okay, uh, fine. At least she didn't waste the money, I guess. Correct. Um, <laughs> I'm obsessed. Okay. So then Chitty Chitty Bang Bang runs a year, and then you oh. just start hopping from show to show to show. Well, let's just talk about because it's going into the Schoenfeld and it's going into the uh, chorus line. So yep. Let's discuss this because it's it's a and honestly it's a good story. I've actually told it a couple of times, but sure. So the short I'm going to make it as quick as possible, and I say that, and I'm like, oh my God. Um, basically, a chorus line started auditioning in the summer of 2005. Okay, so okay. Uh, Broadway w opening was 2006. Okay. In 2005, I went to an open call for a chorus line. The first thing you had to do was a double pirouette. They literally lined us up, double pirouette. And then they would type cast into the next callback. I made it through that. Then they started doing the oh, five, six, seven, eight. Dun, dun, dun. I had never learned it before. I had no idea what it was. I was like, oh my God, I've never seen the movie. I'd never read the play, never seen the play. I knew like one and I knew, you know, singular sensation. I knew what that was. Sure. I didn't know the story of the show. I had no idea. I just was like, I'm going in because everybody said it. Mm. Um, still in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, we're running. So I get to the five, six, seven, eight. And they, I was like, I don't know. That. I was like, Cut. I'm cut. Jay Bender was casting. Um, and Megan Larsh, who uh -huh. went to 
college with me at Florida State, we were the same year. We were both in the theater program. She knew me. So I got cut and blah, blah, blah. And at the time we had to sign that thing because they were videoing us. I was like, hell no, I don't want you to sign it for the documentary, whatever. Right. Fast forward, I got cut, blah, blah, blah. So fast forward, a couple of my friends like in the show over the next couple of months, because this was a really long audition process, had been call getting called back in and they were having appointments and they went in for Sheila and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow. Then I found out there was another open call. And I was, because they had changed the documentary or whatever, and they were having another open call. They hadn't found everybody they wanted originally, blah, right. blah, blah. So this is like, I think October. So from July, fast forward to October, still in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And I went up to Matt Lair. He was in the show with me. I was like, can you teach me this freaking opening combination? Because I have no idea what it is. So he yeah. did. He taught it to me. I went to the open call. Mind you, I also dyed my hair like dark brown, like dark, dark brown. And I had my thoroughly modern Millie, thoroughly modern Millie shoes on. But they kept, I kept, my point kept flipping out of them, you know, cursed banana feet. <laughs> right. And I duct taped my feet into the freaking shoes. I also have like a crop top on and like black tights. Like I have a, I don't have it with me, but I have a picture of my like outfit and I made it through and I was like, okay, great. So next day I got a call back. I wrapped my feet in because I have to wear the same thing again. Right. right. So Megan Larsh was in the room at that point. I danced. We only did the opening combination. And then also they made us do the ballet combination. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't, I duct tape my feet in my shoes. I don't think I can get out of them to do it barefoot. And they're like, oh, it's okay. The person you're being considered for wears heels in the combo. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Great. So then I, uh, I got called back to sing the next day. So I'm, this is my second call. My, second callback. Um, yeah. And I'm dark hair and I'm singing. I sang apparently a perfect song for it. And Megan Larsh goes, oh, Heather, I miss your blondish hair. And I was like, really? I like this color. What she was trying to do was set me like, apparently they were already like, that girl's a Judy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> a little kooky. And so then I get my final, like my final callback. They had given me my sides, um, my sides. And we were all to come to the Broadhurst to uh -huh. is identical to the Schoenfeld. We're on stage. If you've ever seen the, movie, the documentary, Every Little Step, yep. yes. all those things. I was 40 hours. They followed me. I'm, I didn't really make the cut, but um, I'm in all yep. that. So yep. Broadhurst, we go to the Broadhurst. I had gotten food poisoning the day before the final callback because we danced first and then I had to sing the next day. And I had gotten food poisoning because I went to Kodama and had bad sushi. Rest in peace. I think it just closed, I really sadly. Closed. Uh, uh. I was with Tice DiOrio, Chrissy Whitehead, Tony Asbeck, and I went there. They didn't get sick. I did. Um, and <laughs> I was puking and, you know, all the other stuff all night. And the next morning, I was literally like, it was pouring rain. And I had a Gatorade bottle. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So they're a half an hour late. I'm literally in the Broadhurst sitting on the stairs with my book. And I... I um had rehearsed my my sides, the little brat, like as a monologue because I didn't know it was a song. They also didn't give me music. They didn't give me music, they just gave me the song. And I was like, I'm already doing something right. I'm not gonna over research, whatever. So I get on stage, I was the first. I had my book of my book of music and I they're like, Heather, you're go, they're ready. So I this is literally what happens. I go, <laughs> Good morning, hi. And I was like, hey, headshots flew out of my book. <laughs> all over the stage. If you watch every little step, you'll see the big giant stage blaring right. light. And I was like, oh my God, I'm sorry. It wouldn't be a day in the life of Heather if I didn't drop something and I'm trying to like scrape off all my headshots. And you know, when they're stuck to the floor, you can't. Like, I just, and they're like, you're hired. <laughs> oh God. But literally, um, Jay, uh, Bob Avian, the director, turns to Jay Binder uh, and Megan was like, did she do that on purpose? Right. And Megan was like, no, no. <laughs> Like, and apparently I had it. I that was it. And then they're like, "Great!" I sang my song. And then they're like, "Great!" Can you do your song? And I was like, "That we gave you." I was like, "Song." Well, I what you gave me, I did as a monologue. Wow. They're like, they're like "Great, do it as a monologue." And so I did, and um, I got called that afternoon. <laughs> oh my god! Meanwhile, everyone else is like, "God, I'm a dead." <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, what is, what's this, what's the name of the show? Well, yeah. Oh, Heather, that is maybe, I don't know why you didn't make the cut of the Every Little Step documentary. They're I, like, and now for a little comedic relief. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. I, 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 I'm really thrilled and I love that I played Judy and I'm great, grateful for it. it. Gave me like, I teach now. So, um, that was what did it, but man, I never thought it, it was like, my career was like, Soprano, soprano. No, yeah. Dancer, dancer. We're going this way. Bye. You know, so. Gosh, that is crazy. So then here I have a couple. So then you, the cast recording. Yes. Uh, well, here's you, you guys in the show. Oh, there I am. Um, that was which about is, 20 pounds ago. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> for all of us, I think. We were like. It, when, and then the, the cast recording that you're yes. there too. I mean, like um, all of this where. I mean, what was, you don't know, it sounds like you, okay, you don't know a lot of sh about the show. You're not putting a lot of pressure on yourself, which I think mm -hmm. is, again, that naivete really comes into play. And I think that's yeah. actually beautiful and perfect. That was a choice. Once I, once something was going right and Megan's like, keep doing what you're doing. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do research. Right. Do something's happening and I don't know what it is. Yeah. Which is interesting. Like watching the every little step documentary, which anyone who's watching, if you haven't like go watch it, it's, it, oh. it, it, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It explains what it's like for a true audition. Honestly, yeah. it's very honest, yeah. very raw and it's real. So, and yeah. And like every step of the way and Rochelle rack, it's like when she's at the Broadhurst and they're like, you're just not doing what you did eight months ago. And she's like, I don't remember what I did eight months ago. I don't remember what I did a week ago. And it's, it is, it's really interesting that like, just keep doing what you're doing. And you're like, all right. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure. And like how to bring that every time, not really knowing you're just kind of there. Um, so then once, okay, now you're learning it. Biorc is teaching it. You're in rehearsals. The cast is crazy. There's all this pressure because it's the first revival of yeah. the show. And it's only been, you know, what, 16 years since it had closed right. originally. Mm -hmm. And Bob Avian is there and it's, it's new, but it's not new. It's the same, but it's not the same. I mean, what is, does it, what is all of that feeling of being in the middle, of all of that, you know, as it's all going on? Well, so the first day we all met was when we were, when we took that picture that they cobbled together of the line from behind the, the, the what ended up being the poster. Sure. That, that that was the first day we all did a we did a huge photo shoot together, and that was okay. our first time of meeting everybody. And it was like, oh my god, this is crazy electric energy. There's a lot of youth. Like, I mean, Paul McGill was 18. <sighs> Mark, he was, and Jeff Golden was 20. Um, and like people trickled. I was actually on the like older end. I was 28 at the time. <laughs> They're like, um, you're ancient. I'm apparently I'm ancient, and like you know. Like Sheila goes, hell, I'm 30. And I was like, I'm almost 30. <laughs> no, it was that kind of thing. Um, but when we started rehearsing, because we did that shoot, and then we started rehearsing about a month later. A month later, you honestly, I know this sounds crazy. We were very aware of what was going on. And we were rehearsing in 890 Broadway, which was Michael Bennett's studio. Yeah. With, like Mylar, Push, you know, push mirrors that like got holes in them as we go. We're like, wow, this is broad, you know, like kind of thing. Yeah. But it was one of those things where I'm not really sure where the stress came from because it, because by York had her book that she had from 1975 or 76 when they'd frozen the show and she had it and read it. She's like, Heather, you say your line on two uh, stage, right. Then you walk to three, finish your line to Zach, turn around, walk up stage, walk up to the third leg, sit down on one. I was like, what are you? What? I mean, I was one of four people I think that had never done the show before as well. So okay. like it was one of we they put up the show in two weeks. We learned the entire thing top to bottom in two weeks. I was like, I was exploding with my brain because you know, um, if you're familiar with the show, ones head hat to the head, follow through when they do them in a row. Yeah, I didn't ever get taught it because they it never just were like, we it's just everyone kind of knows it, and yes. And, and I was, and thank God I was in the back line. And finally, one day, I said to Chrissy Whitehead because we were running the show, and I was like, Chrissy. I am mouthing things over here. I don't know when it happens. I don't know. Can you? And we sat down and she taught me on a lunch break. Like the one, hat, hat to the head, follow through. Uh, dun, dun, and like that whole thing. I literally was like, oh my God. Because it was such a rigidity of an old feeling of the 1970s Broadway. Yeah. And because by York and Bob just literally plopped it on us. And when yeah. something didn't feel right, 
we the way of fixing it wasn't traditional because you're not trying to talk through the character because they already assumed you knew it you know this is where it's coming from blah blah and so it was a really unique experience because if they didn't get what they wanted right away there was a lot of mumblings and underground stuff about well we might have to replace that person or da, da, da. like okay, we're like guys you taught it to us in two weeks we need to grow with this like what are you right. trying to do and and thank god we went out of town we went to san francisco first that's where we recorded the cast album was actually at skywalker studios i was like crazy da -da -dun, da -da -dun, like <laughs> you know. but it was one of those things where the tension came from that old school mentality uh, this is a true story it's been it's lore but i saw it happen jess golden one time had a bagel during rehearsal and she was eating it on a break and byork literally came up took that, it was like a cut in half. And she uh -huh. took her half, scooped out around it and handed her back. The, it was like, here, you can have it. <laughs> I, I was like. <laughs> You're like, what's happening? What are we, <laughs> what's happening here? It's so shocking because it's so stringent that you you just kind of don't believe it would happen. So you kind of yeah. like, huh. All right. Okay. We're just gonna, okay. You know, nowadays you would get slapped in the face and you'd be out on the butt and who knows? I don't know. So it's, it's a different experience. So that was where that came from. Crazy. <laughs> and then once it opens. Yes. It, 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 did it, uh, you know, I saw it and it was, it was the first time I'd ever, I think it was the first time I'd ever seen the show and it's like the five, six, and then you <laughs> all come charging and I got goosebumps and you're like, oh my God. It, but but in the moment as a performer you're like this has got to be one exhausting and two you're just there for an hour and 50 minutes in yep. as you say in heels the entire show i mean is your body what had you been conditioned having done chicago and millie and some of these shows were you conditioned were you in good shape you know it's what was the physical toll of doing this with the pressure uh inevitably we basically had course line boot camp from day one, right. you know, because every morning during rehearsal, she had, we didn't, cause we didn't need, you know, extra time. Cause she knew the show. We had an right. hour long warm up, like conditioning warm up with Biork, like to the point where you're like, wow, at the beginning. Yeah. But, but towards the end and we did it uh, up through, you know, we would still go to the gym or like I didn't, I was exhausted. Let's be honest here. Yeah. Um, we just got used to it, but we had the ability to get used to it because she, I didn't realize what she was doing at the beginning. I was like, wow, woman, you're trying to break us all. No, she was trying to build us up. Yeah. And um, so and she knows. And, right. As she does. And she knows. And also like what we didn't realize is that we all literally lost so much weight. Like the, yeah, sure. I bought so much because I had money for the first time. I bought like clothes and whatnot within a month after the show closing, nothing fit. Because I was, my waist was 23 inches during that show. That oh my God. Nuts. Like nuts. Um, but basically the hardest part, and anybody that has ever done the show ever will tell you this, unless you're Cassie, it's the standing. Yeah. You go 160 miles an hour, right out of the gate, go, 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 stop. And then you stand. And then it's funny that you said, how's your body hold up? Well, great. I was fantastic at 28. Um, and I was telling this to somebody last night because she's not in theater. And, and I was saying my back and my arm. I was like, what happened was is I stood, my arm turned this way and it inverted like this, holding on for two years straight. I don't fire my deltoid anymore because of two years. Now, granted, I didn't feel that until 10 years passed. Right. But my, my deltoid, in order to just put your arm up, I have to consciously think about getting my mu muscles to fire back there because I, I pulled them forward so much yeah. that I didn't know. And then of course they just degenerate and deteriorate as time goes on. If you were ever on the extreme ends of the line, uh, Deanna or, um, uh, is it Connie? Uh, I think so. Oh, uh, Don, sorry. Yeah. Don's got neck problems from this way. Deanna's got neck problems from this way. So I was actually lucky cause I was relatively in the center. So I don't have any major neck problems from standing like this watching for two years two it's years cra that's crazy yeah it's so crazy yeah it's that's the those that that's why i love these it's those yeah. things that people don't you're like it is weird it's absurd but i have a problem here because for two years i had to do this yeah. i i had a friend there's a track in the anything goes revival they all pulled uh rip their left hamstring everyone who did this one Mm -hmm. ensemble angel track because they're like it's all left the whole thing is left and i'm a righty and yeah. i you watch these girls just every girl who did this track six months in was like and then i pulled my left hamstring and you're like 
God, yeah. it's so weirdly specific and, and crazy on your body. Well, there's also no way to recover. Yeah. You have, it's, it's, you have to endure micro tears and micro, my, it's like, you know, the sum is greater than the bits. Sure. You, you keep doing it over and over again. It just got worse. And ours, yep, that's what happens. It, it's crazy. the nature of the beast. Crazy. Uh, we could talk about a chorus line forever, but we don't have time. So tell me about the show in Feld. Um, and then do you have any specific memories of working at the show in Feld? Yes. Um, you've already told us that you auditioned at the Broadhurst. We know you end up back there. Or if you don't know, you end up back there in Tuck Everlasting. So memories of those two theaters, having them be the same? Um, yes. So I have a couple. I'm just going to punch them. You let me know. Sure. Yep, whatever. Punch um, away. Yep. Punch, punch, punch. So the first thing that, that you have to know is that it is five flights up to the top dressing room. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and five flights of stairs, no elevator. We're not. We had um, Neil last week from yeah. Tuck Everlasting. Uh, he, we talked all about those. So yes, we. <laughs> we were very aware. And by the way, Neil was yes. Neil, so Neil gets it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is let me remind you, I was at the top of both of them. <laughs> Um, so the first time the entire female ensemble, when Mario Lopez, uh, was it second year? I can't remember why, but we were at the top and right. without fail, <laughs> this is what you would hear at the end of the show. We're like, well, I'm done. Kick, 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 clap, clap, clap. We, what they would do is because the dressers didn't want to go up and down the damn stairs. We would all take our clothes off on stage. They gave us robes and you just hear. <laughs> For a total of 10 minutes to get the entire cast up to their perspective apartments upstairs. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just, oh God. I love it. Just elephants. Weird. It never, it never stopped. It was just that trudge. And my favorite was always Charlotte. God, am I there yet? And we'd be like, Charlotte, you're two floors below us. Shut up. Like, <laughs> Cause she was Kathy. Of course. Um, God, that's crazy. That was the first. You have to remember that. Number two, I was always the last person. I don't know why. Also, you can't go on stage without everybody because everybody holds hands in the dark to walk on stage. Heather to the stage, please. Heather, Heather to the stage. <laughs> oh, God. So, then, They're like places as you're brushing your teeth. Sorry. I'm literally just flying down the stairs. So that's the first thing. The second thing is because not only is it a mirror to um, – the Broadhurst. I don't know who's talked about this, but it's also got an alleyway in the middle. Uh -huh. Yeah, we talked about it. Tell us all about it. Go. Okay. So, fun fact. So, at the same time when we were there, it started off Les Mis, not the most recent revival, but the previous one uh, with yeah. Alex Mignani playing Jean Valjean yeah. was over there. It was Aaron Lazar, Jean Valjean, uh, excuse me, Aaron Lazar was on Jaros, uh, Alex Gimignani, and these are important because, we'll see. Um, also Eponine's, you know, uh, I can't remember who it was at the time. Was um, it was gonna be Celia Keenan Bolger, I think, but then it yeah. ended up being- It was Allie um, Ewald. Uh, Allie Ewald, yep. Yeah, it was, I think it was Allie. So um, that was happening over there. And then subsequently, we also had the History Boys with uh, the gentleman, the heavier gentleman. James played, Corden? No, 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 he plays, um, Harry Potter's uncle in the movie. Oh, um, uh, uh, Richard Griffiths. Yeah, I think he passed away maybe. He did, yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then Taren, then the all black cast of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Terrence Howard. And Anika Noni Rose and the whole thing. Yes, correct. And yep. uh, so just that's what I want you to remember. So the very beginning when we're all like fresh and new and still happening and Alex Gimignani and I are friends. So Alex, because he would get all dirty, look down, look down. And then he would come over while we're like, during the opening number, not like right after the big beginning, but when we're all like waiting and they're doing groups of four and Alex just dirt all over his rags. He would literally stand on the proscenium right near us, like to the point where I was literally like, he was right here and I, and like, here's the stage, you know, like we're right in the middle. And so I would just bend over and be like, oh, I'm so new stretch. And he's like, yeah, beauty, get it. Like, so, You're like Jean Valjean? Jean Valjean. And also he was 28 at the time. Like he was young, a young Jean Valjean. So wow. then you know, obviously the only time we leave stage is during Paul's monologue. So Paul's monologue, it's not enough time to go up five flights of stairs to your dressing rooms. So we all hung out, but I would usually go sneak over into the Broadhurst because um, two reasons. I got two. The first part of it right after it, right after Aaron, it wasn't Aaron Lazar. I'm sorry. It was. Um, I forget. No, no, no. It, he looks like Aaron. 
Max, um, Max, Max Millie, he's got that beautiful long name. Uh, he's uh, um, um, not to... not Max von Essen. Yes. Um, it's von Essen. It? It's von Essen. Yeah, Max von Essen. So Max had this billowy, billowy white shirt when he was like red, da, 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 da. and I loved it because I thought he looked like Mr. Darcy in the Pride and Prejudice BBC version. And so I'd be like, "Hi, Mr. Darcy." We would come over in our little leotard, and then I would wait. My I would go backstage. We, I'd wait and be like this, and then I would leave, and then come back right in time for Eponine because I love this. Every word that you said in the dagger in me, I love that. And I was like, yes, and I would leave. <laughs> so that was like, <laughs> you're like, bye. Oh, and we would all play yeah. you know, in like rags, and we're in like little tiny little tight things. So that was my one of my favorite things to do was to go and watch Les Mis just to get out of the dance world for a freaking second. I was like, yeah. I need a reprieve. To the point where one time when they were closing, we went all of us. There was about like I think a handful, like seven of us. Um, we wanted to say goodbye to their last um, their last uh, show, and so we went on stage. We were we were all on stage before half hour, saying goodbye and hugging them and saying blah blah blah. We're all in our sweats. And then Michael Pissarro, who was the stage manager, um, he was at the back of the house and saw all of us out there. And he, this is what he does. This is before half hour, before anybody's come in, we're all warming up. And he goes, a oh, five, six, seven, eight. And without fail, all seven of us turned around and started just instantaneously doing it, just like wide-eyed and like weird animatrons. So that is... Welcome. That's your memories. Welcome to the memories of the Schoenfeld. That's incredible. Oh my God. I mean, that's, and then, but then conversely, when I was in Tuck Everlasting, I was like, oh, yay, we get to go and say hi to, I think it was, um, what's the one where he, the serial killer guy with Christian Bale, American Psycho. Uh, American Psycho. Yeah. American Psycho was in the, the theater, uh, was at the Schoenfeld when we were at the Broadhurst. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we get to go say hi to the American Psycho people. Woohoo. Cause um, Bob Lindsay ended up he's married now to one of the girls in the cast and everything. But without Phil, the only time we had time was Michael Park is singing this beautiful, it's a wheel, Winnie, it's a wheel or whatever. And it's uh -huh. it, and you hear, bah, 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 slam. it would just be like slam dancing back there. So we're like, just kidding. Like I remember closing. <laughs> like, nope. Oops. Sorry, not... uh, sorry, but the uh, the bra the Schoenfeld has a sound lead, so we need to make sure we don't open the door. Don't go, <laughs> Heather. <laughs> Bye, guys. Crazy, you're yeah. like sorry. Um, yeah. It's crazy. I, you know, the guy who built all these theaters, Herbert J. Kraft, who has like the mm -hmm. worst name ever. But he, I mean, it really is. It's incredible that they all like share essentially walls and little, you know. But that you can do a quiet show. You know, Paul could have his monologue or something and something else can be happening loud on the other side of the wall. No one hears it is always, you know, a testament to his acoustic ability circa, you know, these theaters were built in 1917. So it's um, it's pretty incredible. Um, we have a couple comments and then I'm going to let you go. Um, Tom says, of course, line is my favorite show. Loved you and everyone else in the revival cast. Easy to see why your cast says Judy. Thank you, Tom. We love Tom. Hi, Tom. And he says, that was a great story. You're nailing it. Um, Dan Kelly, who we love, he says, this is so good. Killing it. And uh, Sam Quinn, who's a dancer who we love, he said, Heather 2020. Okay, oh, Sam. I we worked with Sam, I think. We worked at Kiss, we did Kiss Me Kate together in Virginia Musical Theater. That's right. Played, see, I'm a soprano. I played Lily Vanessi, and he's delightful. I love Sam. We, um, yes. You want to know what my dream role is? Yes, tell me here. This is what um, Sam says. What's your dream role to play when Broadway reopens? Um, I want to do one of two things. Yep. I want to play Lily in the Secret Garden. Come on, and they're bringing that back. We got to work on that. Yeah. Well, they've been bringing it back for like fourteen years, but I just got to convince them that, like, a to go a little non-typical. Yeah. Hey. I mean, locally, I'm fine, but it's it's just like you don't think of me that way, you know? You exactly. Think, and that's that's the crutch of a chorus line. You think of me as Judy. And yep. I kind of think I've fallen into like, oh, it's okay. You think of me as Judy. Let me just be this way, blah, 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 you right. know? And I'm like, it's called acting, friends. <laughs> like, Correct. <laughs> it's called yeah, it's acting. A blessing and a curse of, of, you know, getting these big roles or getting pigeonholed or getting whatever, put in that box. Yeah, so that would be it. And then uh, I'll, to play Carolee's role in Parade. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh, I have a very that. interesting dark side. That's why yeah. I want to be able to do these things is because 
Yeah, show a different side. It is, but it's also really, um, Patrick Page is my acting teacher, uh, sure. obviously in Hades Town and whatnot. And yeah. he's one of the few people in the world who actually gets to see the depth of my acting. Cause you know, I don't get to do that kind of stuff. Only what he gives me. And he's like, Heather, you need to get the world to see you acting the way I get to see you. Cause, and yeah. I was like, coming from you, I could just die happy. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You're like, that's enough. Yeah. But so there's that. Okay. Okay, those are we'll call that um, post uh, Broadway shutdown goals. Is yeah. what we'll call that. I don't. I care love that. If it happens ten years. Just let it happen. Sure, I love that. You are a joy. You're a delight. Um, thank you so much for spending your Saturday noon on Broadway with us and sharing your stories. People are there's lots of other comments of that you should go. You should be in all of the things, and you're the best Judy ever. And so go look and read those comments. People are wonderful, um, and you're wonderful. Uh, so thank you so much. Good luck with the rest of this insane time we're living through. Um, and uh, before we know it, we'll be running into each other in Times Square in person without masks again, and it'll be like this all never happened. Can I also say that I applied to be a tour guide for Tim? Yeah, you almost I, were. I well, and still want to be, by the way. Sure. Um, I got scared by my test. That was what. <laughs> but the oh, thing. Oh yeah, is, that's right. That scared me. But the, here's the thing: you have been. You're phenomenal. What you do and what you bring. You. I recommend this all the time. I took it. I took the tour. I recommend the tour. I am proud of you. I am proud of you as an actor, but I'm also proud of you as a business owner and just somebody who I would in a heartbeat, no questions asked. Yes. Always. Thank you. I appreciate that. That means the world. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, building anything, whether it's a performing career or it's a business or anything, it's all crazy. But, um, you know, I just keep saying one day closer to Broadway, one day at a time. And we'll all, as long as we're alive, we'll figure it out. And guess what? You've already made it, kid. Yeah, oh, I love it. We call that full circle. Uh, you're incredible. Oh, yes. Do a picture. Um, you're incredible. Um, thank you so much. And um, and good luck. And we'll see you again soon. I appreciate it. Thanks. I wish the best for you. Hey, thank you. Bye. Isn't she? I mean, okay, I'm going to say what I say every time. They're wonderful. Isn't she wonderful? Um, she's wonderful. Uh, we didn't even talk about the 37 other thousand Broadway shows she's been in, but you'll go on IBDB and look up her resume and it, I, you can just see she's talented um, and she has a heart of gold and those people succeed is what we've found. If you've been watching for 14 weeks, uh, you see that common commonality, the common thread between successful people. They uh, have drive. Uh, they, if they have fear, they use it successfully, uh, and they're nice. Um, they're just nice humans. Uh, and so I surround myself with those people, uh, because success leads to success. So, um, I hope you enjoyed her. Uh, and if you haven't seen every little step, go watch it. It is, I think it's the first time I ever cried, uh, just tears streaming down my face when I saw it in the movie theater at Lincoln center. Uh, and it, it really gives an insight into the insanity of our theatrical lives. Um, you guys have been wonderful. I hope you had a great time spending your Saturday with me or a little part of it. Um, if, as always, if you don't follow us on social media at Broadway up close is our Instagram, you're already here on Facebook. So you should give us a like, uh, so you can get all of our content. We are in week 14, uh, which means we have, I don't know, do the math. We have a lot more weeks to go until March. So we're coming at you. Um, if you want to follow uh, uh, Heather Parcells on Instagram, uh, her Instagram uh, is at Heather Parcells. You should follow her. Um, she's very talented. Uh, and if you ever want to buy any souvenirs, uh, our whole gift shop now that it's closed in Times Square is online. So you can get that at broadwayofclose.com uh, forward slash souvenirs. Um, and we just launched our shirts this week, which you haven't seen um, say one day closer to Broadway. Um, which is a little riff on our Broadway sign uh, and my mantra, I'm calling it mantra meets merch. Uh, and so um, we have a, a couple of those left. Uh, you guys have been very supportive uh, and I love that you're sharing my mantra with me one t-shirt at a time. So uh, get your orders in. You guys are all absolutely wonderful. And I will leave you with my final mantra of we are now officially one day closer to Broadway. Happy Saturday noon on Broadway and I will see you again soon. Bye.